Well, um, it is my pleasure to give this lecture as part of the regional training course on wheat blast in Bangladesh. Um, my topic today is pathogen and disease identification. But before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the individuals and institutions that I have had the privilege to work with. And because what you will see today is a result of their effort. So basically we have worked with different institutions in North America and in South America. So let's get started here uh, with a quick comparison of two blast diseases. On the left we have the rice blast disease. And basically here we're, we're talking about uh, an ancient disease that is found in all rice growing regions. It is still often controlled by fungicides and there are more than 85 major resistant genes that have been identified and 18 of them are already cloned. On the other side we have with the wheat blast disease which is uh, an emerging disease. It's considered a potential threat to global wheat production and control with fungicides is still considered unreliable especially under high, highly conducive conditions. Um, unfortunately, there are few resistant genes that have been identified. And at this point, we are we're still working in, in trying to identify new sources of resistance to this disease. So now let's talk about the worldwide distribution of blast diseases. So we know that wheat blast was reported for the first time in Brazil in 1985. And soon after that first report, it was reported in ne nearby countries, in, for example, in, in Bolivia in 1997. Soon after that, it was reported in Paraguay, and it has also been reported in the northeast part of Argentina. Last year, in 2016, it was reported for the first time outside of the Americas and in Bangladesh and we know that it has been causing major losses and um, this year we have been receiving some reports that have to be considered and confirmed. Now, um, that's about wheat blast. Let's talk about the rice blast disease, which we, um, we use the term MOO, which stands for Magna Portha or Isa, or ISA, MOT, stands for Magnaportha or IC triticum. So let's talk about the or IC or ISA um, pathotype. So we know that, that the rice blast disease has been reported in different countries around the world. And this is one important point because these two diseases are very similar, especially in, their, um, in the conditions that they required for uh, establishment and, and spread in many cases. So we have to be aware of that. So comparing a little bit here, um, again, um, wheat blast is not present all over Brazil. It's only present pretty much in the wheat growing regions of Brazil. Uh, it was reported in the Paraná state in, in, in the 80s. Um, and so we have Bolivia here. Um, the the, the Department of Santa Cruz, which is the most important department for, for wheat production. And also we have Paraguay, pretty much the southeast and this northeast part of Argentina. That is not very important on, on wheat production, but it's still um, important because we're talking about a different country here. Now, the reports in Bangladesh in 2016, uh, we have different regions where um, the disease was reported, and uh, you all probably will know much more than I do about, about these reports and the reports that have to be confirmed during this year. Now, uh, here we're talking about the comparison of, um, of, of different pathotypes of Magna Porta or IC. So on, on, on the right side, we have different pathotypes. Um, on, in, in blue, we have the Magnaporta or IC species, and in red, we have the Magnaporta grisea species, pretty much coming from, from crabgrass. But the point that I want to make here is the relationship 
that these pathotypes have in common. So uh, we have the Magnaporta oraceae lolium, which comes from perennial ryegrass. We have the Magnaporta oraceae triticum pathotype coming from wheat, and the Magnaporta oraceae oraisa coming from rice. So basically, all these pathotypes are somehow related. But if you determine the relationship of on, on the closely related uh, association between these, these pathotypes, we can see clearly that the lolium and the triticum pathotypes are more closely related than they are to the ORIC pathotype. So we're talking here about uh, a, a pathogen with high degree of host specificity. So with this regard, we, we also have to discuss the type of symptoms and signs that you can, you can find in, in the different hosts. So uh, the symptoms can vary depending on the, on the host. For example, here we have a digitaria um, species with, with symptoms of, of blast compared to the lesions that you can find on, on rice, for example. So the lesions look a little bit different. Um, and on, on wheat, we also have uh, leaves that can, can show symptoms of, of this disease, but it, these symptoms could vary depending on the, on the weather conditions and also depending on the cultivar that, um, that you have planted and that can show these, these types of symptoms. Now, on the other side, we have the the type of spores, especially the conidia, that you can um, obtain after putting these lesions on, on a humid chamber. And um, the point that I want to make here is that it, it's pretty difficult to identify um, these, these conidia because some of them look very alike. So for example, on the right side, we have some uh, wheat blast um, conidia or triticum uh, coming from the triticum pathotype and compared to those conidia coming from other hosts, the conidia look pretty pretty similar to me. So um, it, in this case it will be very hard to determine um, the type of conidia that is coming from a specific uh, host. So uh, that's something that needs to be uh, probably studied. I know that some people are making associations, but I'm not an expert on that area. Now, in the 90s, um, there were some studies about uh, the host recogni recognitions by the Magnaporta oraceae or ICA patho pathotype. So, in this case, I'm showing some information that is already published. Um, Howard and Valent from 1996 showed um, how the, the conidia uh, of, of the rice pathotype were, was, were able to recognize the host and later penetrate. So on the right side, we have a short video from Nick Talbot showing recognition and uh, formation of the upper soria, which is the, the organ that would allow the pathogen to penetrate to the host. Now, the host penetration, of course, requires the formation of the upper soria, and that upper, upper soria would produce high turgor pressure and so that a penetration peg can, um, can puncture and can uh, allow the fungus to penetrate into the host, as shown on the picture on the, on the right. Uh, host invasion, of, of course, of course, and uh, different processes are associated to that host invasion, but I'm not going to be talking about the, those specific details today. Now let's talk a little bit about the infection, in this case of the Magnaporta or IC triticum pathotype and disease progress. So uh, we know that the, um, probably the most visible symptom in the field is head infection. And we have noticed that, especially on highly susceptible cultivars, uh, 
is the neck that is ha becomes highly susceptible. So from the point point of infection up, the whole head can become bleached out, as shown on on this picture. So what happens here is that the fungus will um, will germinate, will will produce the upper soria. The upper soria will allow the penetration, uh, and the fungus would start a whole invasion process that would later kill, start killing tissues. And so um, the, the photosynthesis products cannot go up to the upper parts of the head. And that is the reason, probably, why these heads become bleached out. So this is a very nice picture show um, shared by Guillermo Barea from Bolivia. It's showing um, a neck, pretty much, that has been affected. And so from the point of infection up, pretty much, um, the whole rachis has been affected and has become bleached out. One of the interesting things that we have been studying in, in the last few years is the disease progress of, of, of the wheat blast. So uh, we don't completely understand the whole disease progress, but overall what we can tell is that the, the infection process occurs very fast. And here in this diagram, what I'm trying to point out is that there are different times in this disease progress curve that we have to consider. So for example, under control conditions, you can um, infect these heads and uh, at about eight to 10 days, you can have completely bleach out heads. And I'm talking here highly susceptible cultivars. Um, but we also have to consider what is happening in, in the field. So how can we correlate this information to, to field conditions? So what we know is that in a period of uh, seven to 10 days also in, in the field, it has been reported that um, growers would go to their field, they, they would see pretty much their, their heads green, but in, in a couple of weeks after that, they, they can return and they have reported that they, pretty much most of the fields are affected by, by the disease. So this is something to keep in mind. Um, this picture shared by Javier Toledo from Bolivia shows the devastation of this disease. In this case, we still have green um, areas of the plant, but for the most part are the heads that um, are affected. On the right, we have a picture uh, showing a completely devastated head with sporulation of the fungus occurring at the level of the neck. Here another picture shared by Guillermo Barea from Bolivia, same situation here. We still have some green tissue, um, but are the heads the ones that are showing the most visible symptom uh, of this disease? However, it's important also to mention that although head infections are the most visible symptoms in the field, we also have seen um, lesions and also signs and symptoms on leaves. And um, in this case, Javier Toledo has shared this picture from uh, taken in Bolivia from a highly affected field. And what the report says is that um, under highly conducive conditions, you can also have these type of lesions on the leaves. And, and, and in, the, in this case, we have cultivar BR18, and this corresponds to the flag leaf, and it, it has been seriously affected. However, the prevalence of blast lesions on leaves is in severely affected commercial fields is still disputed. And this is the main reason why I, I think it would be important to discuss the different symptoms that are occurring in different plant parts. Um, and so, um, Everybody can see uh, in pictures, at least, um, the, the symptoms that we have seen and that we have reported both on their control conditions in, in the lab and also on their field conditions. So let's get started here with um, the type of symptoms that are found on affected seeds. So we know that 
on, on, a, on a highly susceptible cultivar that has been affected by, by the disease, um, at the end of the season you can expect to have this type of grain. So on the right side we have um, grains coming from a non-affected um, head, highly susceptible though, and on the left we have um, grain coming from a highly susceptible cultivar that has been affected by, by the disease. So completely different results here and, and very, uh, very clear. So on the right side we have here a picture shared by Flavio Santana from Embrapa, Brazil, showing on, on the top the, those, those grains that are coming from highly affected um, heads versus those that are coming from um, non-affected heads. Another point that is important to discuss is that depending on the, the level of susceptibility of the cultivar, we can have partial, um, partial infections. So in this case we have this cultivar, cultivar Truman, it's a winter wheat and it's, it's showing a partial level of resistance. Although at the point, at the tip of the head, we have um, those spikelets that are affected. In this case, the same cultivar showing different hits, different levels of infection, uh, and, and various spikelets that have been affected. But the point that I want to make is that if you harvest the, the grain coming from this head, for example, you can expect to have some grains that are not affected, for example, probably those are coming from not, not affected parts of the head, versus um, grains that have different levels of infestation, as shown on these four pictures here. Uh, on the left we have um, a very moderate, I would say, level of infestation versus a more high uh, or high, high level of infestation of the whole grain. So let's assume that um, we are considering a head that has been uh, infected um, with, with different points of infection um, coming from the field. So you end up having um, a highly uh, affected head. And, but what we have to consider is that not necessarily all of the, the grain that you are going to be harvest, harvesting are going to be affected and are going to be showing um, signs of, of Magna Portauraci triticum. So here um, a better picture, so showing different grains that have been affected and that are showing the signs of the pathogen, but other grains coming from that highly affected heads head, or, or those heads are not affected. Uh, something particular that I have noticed, although this has to be proven, uh, more studies need to be um, put into place, is that, for example, the pattern that I have found is that the signs are, are pretty much present at the level of the germ of, of the seeds. But that is a pattern pretty much that I have found on, uh, based on general vis visual assessments. I, I don't think we can make generalizations, but, but this is something worth studying in the future. Now, what would happen if you plant those affected, affected seeds? So in this case, what we have done, um, we have planted some of those affected, affected seeds, and um, 20 days after planting, we have returned to the lab and observed the type of um, symptoms that, that were present on those seedlings. So pretty much uh, the seedlings were still alive, but um, there were signs and symptoms of wheat blast on, on, on the little stems of those, on the, of those seedlings. Here is a different picture. In this case, we have used vermiculite. You know that there are um, bigger spaces and there's more aeration on vermiculite, so this is a perfect medium to, to run this type of experiments. But in this case, we have the, the seedlings that are still alive in, in, in many cases, um, some green parts also present, but the fungus, uh, it's, it's growing and sporulating in, in many cases here. 
So now let's talk about the symptoms that you can find on, on leaves. And I'm, I have seen some reports coming from Bangladesh, especially from, from last year, um, with um, highly affect, affected leaves, especially the flag leaves. So let's talk a little bit about that. So um, again, there are, there are different reports coming from South America, especially from Brazil, and in some cases also from from Paraguay or from Bolivia, um, where the reports say that no symptoms, or at least no visible symptoms, are observed on leaves in many cases. However, we have to also keep in mind that under certain conditions, you can also find um, lesions, uh, signs, and symptoms on, on those leaves. So what we have done here um, under um, biocontainment conditions in Kansas, we have inoculated plants at the seedling stage, and uh, we have returned um, several days after uh, that inoculation happened, and pretty much the, the pattern that we started to see uh, was that especially those, those basal leaves were the ones that were highly affected and the ones that were showing uh, this type of this discoloration in here. So pretty much seven days after, um, we assessed those, those leaves and the, that type of symptom was present. So in this experiment, we selected different winter wheat cultivars with different levels of susceptibility. And we had reported pretty much that it, in general, uh, where the basal leaves, the ones that had shown um, signs and, and symptoms of, of wheat blast. Same thing we did in, in an experiment under a greenhouse uh, condition in Bolivia where we planted highly affected seeds and um, at about the, the, the tillering and also the stem elongation stage uh, when we sampled these leaves we were able to retrieve the, the fungus from there. In, in many cases, hundreds of thousands of spores were reported to be present in small amounts of those leaves. Now, in a different experiment, we also used um, residue um, treatments versus non, not residue treatments. And the idea was to determine how the, the disease was progressing over time across the canopy. So in this case, I'm showing a picture um, from that treatment without residue. And in this case, you see that no chlorotic leaves or MOT sporulating lesions were, were found. Versus those plants where that, that were present in, in the, the treatments with residue, we are seeing that the oldest leaves are chlorotic with abundant MOT sporulating lesions. And so uh, when we brought those, those, those leaves to the lab, pretty much it was very clear that there, there were hundreds of thousands of spores present in small amounts of, of those chlorotic leaves. So um, ever since that experiment, we are we're still working on um, on the analysis of, of the data collected, but, but pretty much what we have done um, is to, to get in con contact with, with people in Bolivia, and we have suggested them to start looking at those basal leaves for the presence of signs and symptoms of wheat blast. And in many cases, when we have visited the fields, we have been able to, to see that the fungus is in fact present on those on those basal leaves. Here's another picture. Um, in this case, the lesions are not as big as shown in previous pictures, but still you can expect um, finding good loads of spores in those small small lesions. For rice, I know that um, a, it has been reported that um, on a rice blast lesion, you can expect to to find. Um, between 10,000 to 20,000 spores um, on those small, small lesions. 
Um, our collaborator and now a student at K-State, Javier Quiuna, has shared this picture also. Um, it was taken in 2015 during uh, a big outbreak or, of wheat blast in Bolivia and it is very clear that in this case the, the lesions have enlarged and they have coalesced and the fungus is definitely sporulating on those, on those lesions. Here another picture from Javier Toledo showing sporulation on, on a flag leaf. And this picture is, uh, is showing the, the type of symptoms that you, you can have depending on the level of susceptibility of the cultivar too. So these are flag leaves that um, were inoculated. Um, and I'm sorry, these are, these are basal leaves actually. And, um, but you can have different levels of susceptibility de depending on the cultivar that, that you are testing. Now, on another study that, that we have already published in 2015, we reported that in small amounts of um, basal senescent leaves, you can, you can find hundreds of thousands of spores. Um, so in this case, what we, we were able to do um, was to um, collect samples from basal leaves of these different cultivars um, that were popular in Bolivia at some point. Some of them are, st are still popular. But uh, it turns out that the most susceptible cultivar at the head stage was the one that was uh, where or where they, the, the spores were found at a higher level. So for example, in this case, we have cultivar atlax that um, showed um, a mean of more than 500,000 spores um, per, per dry leaf matter and actually per gram of dry leaf matter versus those other cultivars that had more um, um, or higher levels of resistance to the fungus at the, at the head stage were also producing less spores uh, per, dry, per, per gram of dry leaf matter. Now there are other reports coming from studies that were established in Bolivia, in this case Karasine Mills from the Ohio State University established some plots and um, she wanted to determine how the disease would spread over time and space. And in this case she had reported that the presence of hot spots within the plots that she had established. So when, when she collected samples of those, those plants and those leaves from those hot spots, she was able to find hundreds of thousands of spores on, on leaves. Now she has also reported that the flag leaf uh, in many cases um, showed signs and symptoms of the fungus. And that's, that's very important, but one, one important thing to mention here is that the conditions um, under which those plants were, uh, were planted, those climatic conditions were very conducive for, for wheat blast development. And actually 2015 was a year um, where blast um, pretty much affected uh, large areas of wheat planted in Bolivia. Now let's talk about lesions on, on heads, these again, these type of uh, lesions and symptoms are the most visible in the field uh, as I have mentioned before. And um, over the last few years it has been interesting to find these type of, of lesions in the field. So not only the flag leaf is affected in this case, but also the the neck, the rachis, the spikelets, and pretty pretty good portions of um, of, of this neck and, and stem were also affected. Um, here another picture showing a highly susceptible cultivar with um, bleach heads. Um, still, you you find good portions of these plants that are still green, but 
again, it will be it would have been very interesting to collect some samples uh, from those basal senescent leaves and see if the fungus was present there. Um, one important thing to mention is that this is a seed-borne pathogen and again if you harvest the seed coming from this highly affected head, um, many of those grains are going to show um, symptoms and signs of the fungus. So um, just to start uh, wrap, wrapping up this, this session, uh, I think it, it's going to be very important, especially during, um, during the surveillance stage of this course, it is going to be important to start um, characterizing the type of symptoms that are present throughout the plant, not only on the heads. Uh, because ultimately what we need to determine is what is the importance of these lesions present on, on those leaves in the whole epidemiology of the disease. If that turns out to be important, then we probably have to design different types of management strategies to control the wheat blast, not only at the head stage, but maybe also at the leaf stage. Um, and so um, I'm just thinking here about growers and, and, and people visiting fields. And uh, even if you go to the field and see that your crop look, looks pretty healthy, don't forget about those leaves that um, are also uh, present there that aren't looking um, that healthy, maybe because of physiological reasons, but also because it could also uh, be because um, the fungus or, or other pathogens are present there. But we have to remember that um, there, there is enough evidence that the fungus can survive on, the, on, on, on those um, senescent leaves that are present in those plants. Um, so, um, it's going to also be important to um, do a survey over all the areas that have reports of, of wheat blast. It's also going to be important to uh, determine if, in fact, um, those reports um, are showing uh, signs and symptoms of, of this disease. Um, also, uh, it will be important to characterize the diversity of those populations that may have survived the first outbreak of wheat blast in Bangladesh. So in that regard, um, Mark Farman from the University of Kentucky, together with other scientists from, from Bangladesh and from the USDA, um, have collected samples from Bangladesh and uh, a characterization of those isolates coming from those samples um, um, where was established. So in this case, the, the purpose was to gener generate high quality genome assemblies and compare each strain across the entire genome. The next step was to filter out repetitive DNA regions and count single nucleotide polymorphisms and in order to normalize um, based on total length of genome aligned and identify known strains whose genome is most similar to suspect isolate. And so the results from Mark's study that consider at least five different isolates coming from uh, the various regions in Bangladesh where wheat blast was reported last year. Um, so genome sequences were generated for these five isolates. And uh, sequences are essentially identical to one another. Um, and uh, that is shown here on this, on this graph. So basically we have different um, pathotypes of Magnaportha oryzae that were included in, in this study. So we have um, pathotypes from, from rice, from brachiaria, from festuca, from eleusine, and also coming from lolium, triticum, and in this case from bromos. But um, 
the ones coming from, from triticum in, in some cases overlapped with the lolium isolates and with at least one bromus isolate. And if we take a look at the Bangladeshi strains that were sequenced, um, basically those strains look very clonal. So the conclusions from, from Mark Farman's study uh, where the first the Bangladeshi outbreak was caused by a single clone of a highly ag aggressive wheat blast strain. And the pathogen population structure is very different to the one or the ones in South America because low or no genetic diversity was identified versus the high diversity that has been reported from the population studies that have been conducted from South American strains. And so with that, I would like to again acknowledge all the individuals and institutions that have helped with information to put together this presentation. Um, and also I would like to acknowledge that this project is supported by the USDA um, Agriculture and Food Research Initiative competitive grant. Um, from the National Institute of Food and Agriculture uh, that has helped us with funding to conduct wheat blast research since 2009. And with that, I would like to thank you again for the invitation and um, I will be connected during this session to answer some questions if anybody has any question. Thank you very much.